Welcome to another edition of Labor TV brought to you by the Kaltzakaikan Labor Council. And today we are going to have some guests with us. We're going to be doing, uh, it's political season, so we're going to have all of our endorsed candidates. And we're going to start with uh, Mark Smith. First, let me introduce uh, Rick Von Rock. He's retired AWPPW. Correct. And myself, I'm Kyle Mackey. I'm the president of the council. Mark is uh, running for county commissioner. And uh, why don't you tell us why you're, why you're running, Mark? Well, I'm, I'm running for Cowles County Commissioner because it's time to run. I've been uh, working in the community on different various boards, serving on the Planning Commission, serving on the Advisory Board, a lot of building and planning issues, along with other government issues. And I feel that we need citizens that are involved and are experienced with the way county government has operated or not operated and want to come in and help make some positive change. So that's basically why I'm running. And before I forget, I want to congratulate you because even though you haven't won the election yet, you've won our support and you've won our endorsement. Uh, it's been, you know, 20 years since a Republican, I think that anybody can think of has got an endorsement from the Labor Council. And there's a reason for that. You know, we could have chose to not endorse uh, somebody for county commissioner. You're running against an independent. But uh, we felt that you answered our questions to our satisfaction and that you are a pro-labor guy and we like to we have the philosophy that we want to set aside the parties and support candidates that are going to support labor so congratulations on that thank you i'm very proud to have received the endorsement from the cowlitz wakaikum labor council and break the stigma that you know labor only supports democrats i think that uh, it, it's, if you look at the history, um, Republicans in the early days did a lot of work for labor, and I think it's time for us to step in and try to help again in Cowles County. Right on. Rick, did you want to uh, get into the uh, questionnaire, you know, uh, talk about where Mark uh, won us over with apprenticeship uh, questions or right to work, things like that? Sure, I do. You know, there's a couple of the questions that really stood out, and one was when there's bidding projects, that happen in the county. And the question was, do you favor the responsible uh, bidders rule for public improvement projects? And you said, yes, that's very important to us. And as we were looking at uh, Joe's position, who was running against you, he just gave a no answer without any further explanation. So that was a concern to us there. <coughs> and, and, and we got other issues as well. Another one, and this is kind of all encompassing, not just for labor, but for everyone, was what is your position on health care for all? And you were quite clear where you feel that every American should have fair and equal access to health care, which is important to us and all Americans. And then when I, I looked at uh, Joe's position on that, and I, I was a little concerned because he answered that I do not believe the federal government should uh, be making laws about health care. An individual state should be allowed to determine how to provide health care for its citizens. I personally do not like paying more for my health care because others cannot afford theirs. Mm -hmm. So uh, these were two of the you know, big questions that stood out to me, some of the differences between you and Joe and how labor feels, why we supported you on these two particular issues here. Yeah, you go down, down the questionnaire and, and from your interviews as well, and one thing after another, you and, and your opponent are very different. You know, he's, he's a newer guy to the game, to the uh, politics. He's a nice kid, but you, you know, have been around a long time and worked with labor in the past, I believe. Yeah, I was a member of the IBEW Local 26 mm -hmm. for marine electricians in Seattle uh, for a brief period of time. Uh, my wife is currently uh, a member of the Cowlitz County uh, Employees Labor Union. Um, and I look at the labor as a, you know, a benefit to your community for wages, income, retirement, and insurance. I mean, if we would not have had the labor movement, I doubt very seriously that we would see all companies providing retirement benefits, health benefits, and the scale of income that we're used to in America today for the middle class. Yeah, I think it's that knowledge that, you know, we, me and you have talked about what unions bring to our community and, and the economy. What it, uh, what it does besides uh, all the benefits and things, but getting away from those Walmart minimum wage style jobs, mm -hmm. it really, you have the understanding of what unions do for our community, so. Absolutely, you know, I'm looking at the unemployment numbers, uh, which 
show that they've fallen in the last two years. Um, but if you look at the numbers of the jobs, you know, $12 an hour jobs is what 80% of those jobs have been in the last two years. And uh, if you look at the economy that we need to, to stimulate in Cowlitz County, you're not going to do it at $12 an hour wages. So what do you hope to accomplish on the uh, commission board? Well, um, I'm, I'm setting sights pretty high. What I'd like to see is cooperation. You know, I'd like to see a more friendly atmosphere between um, business in the community um, and our regulations, and also to try to bring in labor and industry and also the, the regulations all together so that we can set up, um, similar like we were talking earlier, a maybe labor roundtable type program where we could actually sit down and look at identifying businesses and companies that we'd like to see come to Cowlitz County. Um, you know, I don't think we want to keep looking for the lowest paying jobs to come to the county. I think we need to set our sights higher and we need to be a little more selective. We have a very um, opportunity, a very, I'm sorry, very good opportunity with our port being um, not overused right now because we have the opportunity to bring in new industry and recreate our economic future here. Uh, but it's going to take all of us working together and I think that that's the biggest thing we need to do. We all need to get on one page together. You know, speaking of that, some of the things you're looking at doing, and I know I've known you for the last couple of years coming to the commissioners' meetings, and there's a couple of issues that have come up that, that's kind of brought a concern uh, to the people that want to come into this county and get jobs, and, and that's a permitting process. I'm sure you've noticed that. What are some of the things you think you might want to do to make that better? I think that, uh, you know, we, we always have permitting processes, but what we have to make sure is that our permitting process is fair, and equitable, and that we don't put future corporations coming in here into a higher level and higher standard than what we've set. Um, because they, then they can't evaluate you know, what the cost is going to be and what they need to do to come in here to do business. We also need to be proactive. We need to come out and, as I was saying, if we form this group and organization, we could look at the type of businesses we want to go after. So we could basically pre-approve um, bringing in an industry that we've all looked at and said, boy, it would really work well at our port. Uh, we have the labor force for it. Um, their contracts would be good for us for 20 to 40 years and plan our business development instead of just being sitting here waiting for someone to show up. Um, I think that we really truly have to market ourselves for the exact market that we want to go after. And uh, I don't know the answer to that right now because we haven't gotten together to discuss that. But I think working together, we could go out and look for that. Do you have anything you want to uh, close with? Um, but I, again, I'm, I'm very proud to be endorsed by Labor as a Republican. Um, I don't think people understand that you know, the main thing that we need in our county right now is for everybody to be working together. Um, you need people that are knowledgeable. Uh, most people don't like politicians, but you really do need politicians today. Not the, the ones that we have in office currently, maybe, but you need people who understand the political process so that then we can move forward. Um, I know we're troubled today, the finances aren't good, the community doesn't look like we have a, a lot of future, but we really do. And you really need to really work hard this year when you look at who you're voting for and vote for someone that you really feel can help support the future of Cows County. On behalf of Labor, I want to thank you for coming in and, and joining us and talking with us. Great, I sure appreciate it. Thank you very much. And thank you, Rick. Thank you. Next up, we have uh, Darren Holman joining us. He's running for Cowlitz County Sheriff. You want to start out by telling us a little bit about yourself and why you're running? I'd love to. Uh, my name is Darren Holman, like you said. I'm running for sheriff. Uh, the main reason I'm running for sheriff is because it's time for a, uh, a new perspective at the sheriff's office. We've basically had the same leadership model at the sheriff's office for the past 20, 30 years, and it's time that we really update that. I'm a Kelso native, grew up in Kelso and went to Kelso High School. I uh, graduated from Lower Columbia College and uh, went on to the Evergreen State College and then on to Portland State University. Brought my family back here after I spent about five years in the Army. Uh, I was in the, the first Gulf War where I received a, a bronze star during the Gulf War and I was a sergeant upon uh, getting out of the Army. Um, the Sheriff's Office is where I ended up. It's, this is where I wanted to be. This is an important role in our community and I thought that that would be a great place to, to utilize the skills that I already had from my experiences in the military and my, you know, just general life experiences. And I've, I've done a, a pretty good job since I've been here. I've been pretty happy with, with how things have gone. 
And it's bringing that new perspective into the sheriff's office that's, that's so important. And I think I'll be doing that um, if elected as sheriff. Right on. So uh, going through your questionnaire uh, and your interview, the process that we had, you, you know, we talk about the past a little bit and, and how things have happened here in town. What would happen in the future if you were sheriff uh, during, say, a labor dispute? Uh, how would you handle a situation like that in, in general? Well, I, I can tell you that I'm very empathetic to the, the entire plight. I understand it. I was the first vice president of the Deputies Guild here locally. And so I understand the, the, the importance of, of being able to speak your mind and, and being able to have that collective voice. With that, knowing what, you know, knowing what I know now, we've learned a lot of lessons. We, we've learned a lot about understanding each other and about uh, talking. It's pretty much as simple as that. So I would absolutely open up my door to, to all involved and let's, let's talk about things before they ever escalate to a, a certain level that we don't, none of us want it to be at. So it's important that we communicate and communication I think would be the key. And again, it's not that I don't understand, I, I understand the plight, but it's also important that I keep the peace in, in the county and uh, open up those communication lines really early. Rick? And I appreciate what you said there, and when we went through the questionnaires, and this was one thing that really stood out to me. I understand peace needs to be kept, but it's how it's kept sometimes that what it gets down to. And when I went through the questionnaire that you filled out, and the question was during a labor dispute, how would you go about respecting workers' freedoms of speech and other U.S. labor rights while enforcing the law? And your answer was quite clear. It said, I believe that the most powerful two labor unions have is their collective voice, whether that's done silently or as part of an open protest. As sheriff and former guild representative, I would understand and respect that need to be vocal. If asked, I would be open early to discussions regarding the law while establishing boundaries with the goal of allowing the workers the ability to be heard, and at the same time, keeping the peace. However, if laws are broken, I have taken an oath to uphold the laws and the Constitution of the state of Washington and the United States, and I will enforce those laws. To me, that was an excellent, excellent answer. And then when I looked at your opponents, and it was the same question, he uh, responded by saying, labor laws are quite clear as to the rights and responsibilities of each party in a labor dispute. However, that is my, not my area of responsibility. Public peace and public safety are my responsibility. My expectations have been and so remain that all citizens do what the law allows them to do and respect the other's rights to do the same. Just don't break the law. It's that simple. And, and you kind of clarified things. Well, the law sometimes isn't simple. We have to talk to the various parties, find out what's going on, and then we can work through those issues. So I was very, very appreciative of how you responded, and I believe that's what you would do. And that's one of the reasons we endorsed you. Yeah, to me, just to you know, expound on that, I'm looking for, I think what labor is looking for is neutrality and professionalism, and it's that simple. And I think that you have answered the question correctly, and, and I like what you had to say. And that's exactly what I, what I feel. And, and it's very much in line with, with Sheriff Lucas in Clark County. And I agree with what he said. He wrote a, a public statement stating very similar to what I wrote. And that you know, we have to respect the person's rights and a person's rights to speech or whatever it may be. And we can't just throw down a blanket and say that that's it. It's the only way it's going to be done. That, that's not how it works. We have to talk. We have to understand everybody's boundaries. We have to understand what, we, what everybody can and can't do and keep neutral. The sheriff's office, that's the main reason why I'm running as an independent, because it's important to me that the sheriff's office be a neutral position. And we shouldn't be burdened down by partisan politics at all. So that's, that's, it reflects in what my answer there was, and it also reflects in everything that I'll do as sheriff. Do you have anything you want to close with? Any closing statements? I just would like to say that I'm, I'm very excited about this opportunity. Uh, we've, we've come a long way. It's been a long, long uh, 10 months now. Um, but we're excited about our, our prospects. I've been doing a lot of doorbelling and talking with a lot of people locally, and, and overwhelmingly I'm hearing people are ready for a change. They're ready for something new and a fresh perspective. Uh, the sheriff's office is not uh, a personal office, and it shouldn't be construed as such. It, it really is the, the people of Cowles County's office, 
and it's time to, to make it neutral, and it's time to move forward and uh, have a progressive, innovative uh, department that works for the citizens. Well, I want to thank you for, for coming, and on behalf of Labor, thanks for coming and All joining right. us. Thank you very much. Once again, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, now we have joining us Ryan Jervakainen. He's running for county prosecutor, and you can go ahead and start out and tell us why you're running and a little bit about your background yourself. Oh, good afternoon, Kyle. Good afternoon, Rick. Thanks for the invite. Um, again, my name is Ryan Jervakainen. I'm running for uh, Cowlitz County prosecutor. I guess a simple question, why am I running? Uh, I think uh, you know, over the recent past, you know, you've heard a lot of people think it's time for change. Uh, I guess my personal position, um, I grew up here, both my wife and I. We moved back here after law school around 2006 uh, to raise a family. And you know, you see crime rates have been getting worse, um, drugs, et cetera. And I think it's time that uh, you know, there be a, a fresh perspective, new ideas, and I think it's time to bring the county in a, a different direction, hopefully for the better. Um, so that's why I'm running. Uh, again, as I pointed out, I have a wife who's also from here, and uh, we have two children. And uh, join this adventure of uh, politics to hopefully make a change in the prosecutor's office. It's a, it's a different world, isn't it? Politics are a different world, yeah. and it's not something that I've been accustomed to. So, but it's 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 been fun and an adventure, and I've enjoyed it so far the last four or five months. Mm -hmm. You know, I've heard uh, people criticize you about experience. What do you say to those people? Well, experience obviously uh, can be something that is helpful, but it's you know, also something that could be a detriment. You know, my personal experience, uh, during law school, I worked for the city of Spokane Valley. I also worked uh, for a bit for the uh, uh, county of Spokane, or yeah, Spokane County. Um, for a few years, I did mostly civil stuff, real estate business, contract, estate planning, and then uh, last six years or so, I've done every area of criminal law from juvenile district court and superior court felonies, which I do now and I've been doing for some time now. Um, so I consider myself to be pretty experienced in the overall picture. Uh, on top of that, I went to college, got my business uh, degree and business administration degree with a concentration in law, so I do have uh, that education, but I think when you hear of you know experience matters, which obviously is something my opponent has been pushing because she has been in the prosecutor's office for some time now, and she has been our incumbent for 13 years. Um, experience only matters if it's making a difference for the positive. Unfortunately, what we've been seeing is drugs have been getting worse, uh, you know, crime, uh, crime has been getting worse. And so she does have experience. I think I have my experience, but you know, experience matters if it's, that experience is making a positive change, which I have not seen that uh, in the recent past. You have a really catchy, what is it, a slogan? Seek justice, serve justice, do justice, is that what it is? Yes. So tell us what that means. Seek, serve, do is essentially, obviously you need to have a plan, um, you, know, you need to serve that justice, and you also need to do it. Uh, kind of a, when coming up with that, um, for example, my opponent's uh, slogan has been seeking a just result. Well, seeking means you're looking for. And I think the way our county has been uh, moving is seeking does not mean that you actually get that result or that you're getting results. So seeking justice is coming up with what are the ideas you know, that you need to implement. So. Um, what my belief is, is when those persistent, serious, and violent offenders, which are your people who are in and out of court on a continuous basis, uh, flooding the court system um, and in and out of the court system, you know, those are the types of people that you can make a difference you know, by keeping them off the street. So the accountability of those people is a way to, one, keep them off the streets, two, keep us safe. And three, um, you, you've, we've heard a lot about you know, court congestion, in Cal, especially Cowles County, and we probably don't have time to talk all about all that right now, but you know, it's a way to reduce those violence eventually with time because you're keeping certain people off the streets longer, therefore reducing crime. Um, another idea that I've, you know, another um, part of my position is, is 
those young, first-time, low-level petty offenders, they need that opportunity. Um, you know, you, you see a lot of people who, who've done something, and they'll probably never do anything again. Um, right now, we do not have a diversion program in the county. And I'm not talking about doing diversions with everybody, but those specialized people who you know, have that opportunity to um, go down the right direction or get on the right path, uh, remain a productive, or become and remain a productive individual. Um, you know, uh, serving justice, I'm from here. I think prosecutors should live in the county that they're working. I think having a vested interest allows somebody to make better decisions in the county. Um, I am running independent. I think it should be nonpartisan. Uh, the prosecutor's office, much like the judiciary. Um, and I think there does need to be more transparency. Um, you know, why are certain policies being made and or decisions? For example, there was the article in the paper today about the Oski case. Um, you know, I don't know if that was politically designed or whatnot, but you know, here's some decisions why a decision was, or here's some reasons why a decision was made two years ago. You know, keep the community involved. Uh, be open to the community, whether it be community forums, um, but I think there does need to be transparency. After all, you are in public office and you serve the county, so I think there should be more transparency. And doing justice is just, uh, you know, getting it done, uh, making sure that there is, uh, um, you know, you need consistency in your prosecution. Um, so in the brief time that we have here, that's kind of the seek, serve, do. Thank you. Okay, you know, before I ask you a question that I have here, one, I, I want to address an answer you made about experience. I mean, people have to realize that until you are elected, you don't have the experience. When you're first time elected, when Sue was first elected, she did not have the experience. Experience comes by doing the job. So I think people have to realize this. See how the job's doing, and if the experience that the person has that's doing the job isn't working, and it's best to find someone to replace that person and let them get the experience and see how they do the job. So I'm in total support of that. And, and you mentioned your family a little bit, and I'm talking about your wife there, and her granddad, Floyd LeBaron. Yeah. Uh, I went to school with him. Uh, he was my teacher, great person, and I appreciate that. So those are the two things I want to mention before I get to the question, because we are a labor TV issue here. And the one question that I would like to address is that <coughs> during a labor dispute, how would you go about respecting workers' freedoms of speech and other U.S. labor rights while enforcing the law? Well, obviously, um, workers, there's, we all have rights under the Constitution. Uh, you know, we have the First Amendment right, we have freedom of speech, uh, we also have the freedom of association. And obviously, you know, unions were created for a reason, um, you know, to unite and uh, have a voice, you know, essentially in a group setting, which is obviously much more powerful than the individual person. Um, obviously, labor is essentially the reason for a working wage. Um, obviously, there have been some recent, you know, attacks on, on labor, and obviously it's a fight every day. Um, with respect to You know, picketing, um, you know, expressing your voice. Obviously, you should be able to do that, uh, you know, in a manner that um, gets your point across. Now, obviously, I'm sorry, I'm trying to think here with respect to. Uh, That's fine. It's, uh, you know, <clears throat> like, I, like we mentioned with Darren, who's running for sheriff, you know, and we were. Do you want to read his answer? Right? Yeah, I'm going to read in the, in the questionnaire that you had yeah, a long time ago. Yeah, I, I was impressed by it, and, and the Labor Council was too. And I think that was in the context of the EGT yeah. um, thing. But. Yeah, but this is in the context of all labor disputes. When you said protesters who are engaged in protected activities should be allowed to do so without encumbrance. However, when protected activities become criminal activities, the state needs to step in and enforce the law in a fair and just manner. So, so we were impressed that, yeah, you know, we have these rights here, but when things kind of go awry on either side, that you will enforce the law, but it will be in a fair and just manner. And, and that's what we're looking for. 
and that does go to you know equal justice. A lot of what you see, you know, is a cry for equal justice, um, and I think that's a prime example. You know, treat everybody the same. You know, allow somebody to express their rights under the Constitution or otherwise. You know, whether it be speech or assembly, association, picketing, uh, labor dispute. You know, labor um, negotiations. But obviously, you know, you need to treat everyone um, the same as you would anybody else. Um, but you know, you do need to treat people equal and allow them the opportunity to do those things because obviously, you know, that is very important. With the unions, and you need to be able to express that um, without being interfered upon, unless um, it's a situation where you are going, you know, above and beyond what you should be doing. Yeah, we want to we want to learn from the past. You know, things happened here a few years ago, and, and it got, uh, you know, divided our community, and, and we want to move forward. There's uh, negotiations currently. Uh, one of the big ones is at Capstone, formerly Fiber, and they have a lot of members and. You know, this question is, is designed to find out, get an answer from you, how you would handle a situation like that. And I think that it was answered satisfactorily. And uh, we, uh, you know, that was the big one. Did you have any other questions, Rick? No, I, I think that summarized everything that we're looking for in labor. So I, we appreciate uh, everything you're doing, and that's why labor as a group we're here endorsing you. I appreciate it. And, and again, just on a side note with respect to that, you know, obviously I, you know, I kind of talked to you guys about this before, but a collaboration can go a long way between all parties involved, um, you know, whether it be law enforcement, prosecutor, mm -hmm. BNSF, uh, the union, employer, et cetera. So I think collaboration from the get-go can uh, obviously be something that can alleviate issues, whether it be, you know, in the middle of some form of dispute. Do you uh, have a closing statement, Ryan? You know, I don't. Uh, quick one. Quick one? Mm -hmm. I just, uh, you know, Rick uh, brought up Floyd the Baron. He was, uh, you know, obviously uh, very respected, you know, uh, coach, Castle Rock. Actually, their gym is named after him. And, mm -hmm. you know, one thing you, you don't really get involved in until you kind of, you know, I'm not on many boards, but, uh, you know, some people ask, you know, civic involvement, you know. And what I tell people is, you know, I'm coaching soccer right now, and people are like, well, why are you coaching soccer in the middle of a campaign? You know, it's because it's something that I enjoy doing, and I coach t-ball in the spring, and, you know, when I tell people, I'm, I'm happy to tell people that's what I do for civic involvement, that's probably the, you know, one thing I was raised up on, and I think that's probably, for civic involvement, probably the best thing somebody can do is, you know, getting involved with kids' lives. Because from the prosecutorial perspective, you know, if you can help the people coming up, you know, that's going to help in the future, but I just wanted to bring that up. You know, I find that to be some of the best civic involvement. I know Floyd was, you know, very respected uh, in the community, and although he, it's my wife's side of the family, you know, my dad did the same thing. Not on that high of a level, but um, other than that, I'd just say I would appreciate uh, anybody's support come November 4th, um, working hard at it, and uh, hopefully uh, it happens on November 4th. It's only about a month away. Yep. Everybody needs to get out and vote. We wish you the best. And on behalf of Labor, thanks for coming in and talking to Thank us. You, and uh, we'll see you around. Okay, just one final statement before you go. The ballots will be out on the 17th. So make sure when you get them, you open them, you fill them out, and send them back in. Okay, up next we have Bob Dingenthal joining us. He's running for the 3rd District House Congress. Yes. Did I say that? Yes. <laughs> And uh, why don't you go ahead and tell us why you're running and a little bit about yourself. Sure. I'll tell you why I'm running. I think that uh, our current representative has not really represented the broader base of people in this uh, district. It's a broad and very diverse district from Pacific County to Klickitat, and uh, the needs are different for very, um, you know, various areas, but the one common thread for everybody is the economy. And we look out and we see the economy is ostensibly quite strong. Housing sales are back up and the stock market's going crazy, but where it's not really helping is the average person. You see, uh, like teachers haven't got a cost of living raise in six years. I mean, that's unconscionable. Uh, the, the, the bulk of the money is going to a very small array of people. And when you see labor, the backbone of America, you know, what, what's uh, built us into the nation we are today, 
they're the ones that have to take it on the chin like we saw with the machinists of it Boeing when things are bad, but when things are good, like Boeing now has some pretty big uh, contracts for aerospace and, and some of the new jetliners, I don't see them going back and saying, you guys were good uh, soldiers uh, when we were in tough times, and here, let's give something back to you. And I think it's not just people in labor unions that are suffering this way. I think that um, we see it pervasively, and if we're gonna build a strong economy, we have to build it from the middle out. If you don't have consumers, you're not gonna have a sustainable economy. And, um, and that's one of the things I really wanna fight for, and I think it's uh, the American people want it too, and the people of this district want it very badly. So it's, it's a tough decision to run, but eh, why not? So what's your experience with uh, labor unions or, or your past experience? Sure, well, I grew up in a labor household. My father, I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, a uh, very strong labor town when I was growing up. I say easily more than 50% uh, of the people in the community were some part of a labor union. And then in the neighborhood I grew up in, which is very blue collar, it was probably closer to 80%. And uh, the unions were very strong in, we had the automotive industry and the steel industry there, but various other ones. And not only were they, the, and my father was a member of two unions, AFTRA and SAG. He worked in the television industry so he was part of those unions. And uh, we saw the good that it did us personally as far as getting health care that we didn't have before and eye care and, and things like that. And I love to tell everybody, we, we all, seven kids in the house, we all had to get glasses when we got union eye care, even whether we needed or not. We, said, we got a benefit here, we're gonna use it, damn it. <laughs> um, but uh, the, um, I saw all the travails of the, the the city, when we were going through, when, it, when uh, there was the struggles with the unions, when they're strong, everybody benefits, not just the labor people. Everybody around, to be competitive, you end up getting uh, better benefits and better pay and more respect. And you see today where the average CEO makes 425 to 450 times that of the average wage earner. And they say, well, we gotta pay well to get the, the best uh, executives were really, shouldn't that same mentality apply? Uh, you should pay well for the best workers all the way up and down the line. So um, it's just something I'm, I'm really passionate about. And, and the other area when I was with Senator Cantwell's office, of course, I got to know most of the, the organizations in the 3rd Congressional District. And I just found that consistently these were decent, thoughtful, community-oriented people who were only asking for fair pay for a day's work and, and nothing outrageous. Yet I would see Republicans and like Chris Christie and other people like that saying, I'm gonna stand up to the unions. Why? You know, what are they doing? You know, they're doing good quality work for fair pay. And I think that's what it's all about. Rick? And I'll speaking on a federal level where you will be, there's been some issues that have I like the assumption the that I will be there, yes, thank I'm you. I'm saying you will be, because I, I believe we're going to help you get to that position. But, but some of the issues that affect all working people, such as the minimum wage, mm -hmm. and, and as you mentioned earlier in part of your presentation, that there needs to be a way where people can be able to afford benefits to retire, so forth and so on. And we know on the current minimum wage back in D.C., that's not happening. In fact, we are doing more to subsidize people on minimum wage than what they're actually making. So what would your position be to try to increase the federal minimum wage? Sure, we definitely need to do it. And here's my thought on that. When you have companies that pay minimum wage and keep you under 30 hours of work, um, if you just took the bonuses that were paid on Wall Street last year, just the bonuses, not the pay, and you took them and gave them to people on minimum wage, we'd bring most people above the poverty line. So, you know, it's an equity issue, but it's a, the minimum wage is really a start. It's a place, if we could just get back to, you know, 10, 10 an hour, I don't think it's outrageous amount of money for a minimum wage. And that, but that's really the starting point of it. With minimum wage, uh, a national minimum wage, you can't stop there. You need to give people an opportunity to grow. You need to have a young man like yourself you come into the workforce and you think, well, if I work hard, 
you know, five years from now, maybe I can uh, get married and buy a house and after that do different things, send my kids to college. And that bolsters the whole economy. So the studies are showing now that if we raise the minimum wage, the net effect would be beneficial to the economy as a whole. Uh, the concern for a lot of people is that if I have a small business, I can't afford to pay, uh, pay a minimum wage. It might be the case in some cases, and that would, that would be a really difficult thing. And I understand that. And if you're running a, a, a business where the margins are really thin, that might affect you. But what we see it much more often is huge companies you know, McDonald's and other fast food organizations, they're doing quite well. I think they can absorb that. And we've seen what happened in Seattle and in uh, Tacoma with a much higher minimum wage, $15 an hour. It's starting to prove itself out. So, yeah, I think it's a start. It, it, by the way, it just brings us back to where we were. It, it's not leaping ahead. It brings us back to where we were about 10, 15 years ago with a minimum wage equity. So. Uh, yeah, I think it's something that needs to be done to keep a sustainable economy. Otherwise, you don't have consumers. Okay, yeah. I know this is live and I'm going to mention this because when you mentioned the, the minimum wage increase, you said 10 cents an hour. I'm sure you were thinking the federal wage at $10 an hour. Yes, yeah. yeah. Okay. Just I thought it was $10.10, 10 so I take yeah. you right. Yeah, but, okay. Yeah. So we're just going with that. And, and as we go from the, the minimum wage, uh, we've got the Employees Free Choice Act. Uh, what's your uh, opinion on that? We've been looking for that in labor. Uh, it was promised to us going on almost eight years ago now. How would you look at it? This is something I'd fight for. When promise is made, we need to keep it. Where's our integrity as a nation if we make a promise and then don't keep it? And people have that same concern about Social Security, about their pension benefits, all that sort of thing. If we start to renege on promises we make, then why would anyone want to go into an industry based on a promise of some benefit to come down the road? You're just going to immediately assume, well, they're probably lying to me. They did in this case, and they did in this case. So you know, these are things that are worth fighting for in Congress. And by the way, I think it's bipartisan that I'll get support on both sides, because they're finding that the constituencies in a lot of these states are really uh, supporting it. And as we know, most politicians are there to support their constituency, and they will. If it's not a political football, then we'll be able to move it forward. Thank you. Um, what, else, what else do you plan on trying to be involved in, in an accomplishment and accomplish when you get to Congress? I think one of the big things for me <clears throat> is we need to evolve our educational system in the United States right now. And I see it on a lot of different levels. One is that um, high school dropout rate across the nation is about 20%. I understand it's better here in, in this county. Um, I know in some areas of the state it's much worse. Some areas of the country it's much worse. But if you look across the nation, you get a one out of five people who doesn't graduate from high school. Um, that's how are we going to have less than 5% unemployment if we have 20% of our people don't graduate from high school. And what we need to do there, funding, of course, is the biggest thing. That's number one. We're, we're in uh, uh, conflict with the court decision here in the state of Washington with the McCleary decision, but also uh, across the nation. We have, to, we have to fund the schools. We have to make classrooms, uh, classroom sizes smaller. We should be paying teachers, most, most of which were union members, and have not taken, gotten a cost of living uh, adjustment in six or seven years now. Now tell me how many CEOs in this country have not gotten a pay raise in six or seven years. But a big thing too is we need to have a curriculum that goes back to some fundamentals. Not everyone is going to go to college and then go to work on Wall Street. Now, I have two sons, one of them is going to college and one of them is not. And um, the, the basic training for good careers careers in you know, electrical work and plumbing and carpentry and hundreds of other things that you have the opportunity to do. Those, that baseline training is not there for most kids. When I was a kid, you got out of school with at least some fundamental training in what we called shop back then. And now it's more technical than ever. So if you get somebody, SEH America applies, or, um, hires a lot of kids out of high school, uh, but they have to have some fundamental skills. We've got to put that back in schools. 
we've got to give kids the opportunity to go into trades like they did so many when I was a kid. And that, I think that'll make a huge difference in the employability of the nation. We can't uh, offshore, and God help us if we ever try, we can't send offshore uh, jobs in, in construction and electrical work and plumbing and all those different things. You need those skills here. We need manufacturing skills too, by the way. Rick, did you have any other questions? No, I'm just going to be in line with you on, on that one thought there, because we look at the minimum wage workers in our state, 85% mm -hmm. of them are over the age of 20. So we need to create jobs so these people can have family wage jobs, just not jobs, yes. but family wage jobs. And that's quite a, a telltale thing for our state. Yeah. And it's not just for them. It's for all of us as a community, as a society. If we have, we know if people have good jobs that they can depend on, then their health is better, which costs us less in the long run. Then we have less crime. We have all the things beneficial, lower divorce rates, all the things that are beneficial to a good society. And we can do it. There's no question we can do it. Some places are doing a better job than others. I think Washington's in a really good position to go back to that, build that strong middle class. And people say, well, what's the mechanism we have to build the middle class? How can we do it? It's there. It's called labor unions. Here's where people who work with a strong union in their business, not only does it provide highly skilled, trained people, but it also takes care of a lot of the HR issues that other companies would have if they were managing non-union employees. You know that that person shows up with a union card. They're well-trained. They know when to work on time, show up. If they have issues, the union supports them. So that's how we rebuild that middle class. At one time in this country, we had almost a 50% of the private workforce was union, and now it's less than 8%. And the, higher, the farther we go up that line, the better off we're going to be. Do you have a closing statement? Something you want to... no, I, I just want to thank you guys not only for inviting me out here today and supporting me, but for all you do in the community. One of the things that I see that I love is when I almost said, instead of stuff, I almost said another word there. When stuff needs to get done, you know who shows up? Labor guys all the time, whether it's helping a neighbor out or helping a uh, you know, community project of any type. They're there every time. You can count on them. You can write the names down and pencil them in. So thanks for being a part of our community. Well, thank you. Thanks for running. And uh, we look forward to working with you when you're in Congress. My pleasure. Thanks very much. Thanks, guys. Thank you. And now we have uh, Lauren Sevilla. Sevilla. Sevilla running for Cowlitz County PUD. I knew I was going to screw that up. Uh, everybody does. You're not the only one that's right. been called Sylvia and everything else. But as long as you don't call me late for dinner, we're, we're good. And you All can right. see nobody's done that lately. <laughs> so. All right. So why don't you tell us why you are running for PUD? OK, well, um, I've actually thought about it uh, probably six years ago when I first started looking at some things that were going on within the PUD that uh, I just didn't think were, were correct. and. Uh, I don't really want to go into details about that, but anyway, I started really paying attention, and I would be glad to go into details at some other point in time. You know, we don't, we're kind of limited here. Uh, so I really started paying attention to what was going on. I filed a couple of uh, requests for public information, which I got, and, uh, and I still have them. And uh, it ended up that there was some, not that the RPUD was doing anything wrong, but the Washington State Association was kind of doing something that really wasn't ethical. But anyway, my name is Lauren Sibla. I decided to run. And I've been uh, working very hard at it uh, for the last two years, uh, going to several different functions, um, meeting people, because nobody knows who I am. Uh, I, you know, I don't have any name recognition in this county. And uh, as I've kind of said, tongue in cheek, uh, maybe not such a bad thing when, with regards to the PUD these days. But hopefully, uh, I can get in, get in there and, and we can change some of that. I, I believe my experience. Um, Will, will allow me to do that. But I'd like to just give you a little history about myself. Um, uh, I'm married. Uh, my wife and I have been married for 42 years uh, this past uh, September 23rd. So I'm pretty good at conflict resolution there. Uh, you know, if you can make through 42 years of marriage, uh, that says something about where I think I'll be able to work with these guys at the council or on the, on the commission. Uh, we have three children, and they all live in the local area. or well, not local area, but our youngest daughter lives in Seattle, and our oldest daughter lives in Portland, and our middle daughter lives in Woodland. And I'm pretty much uh, semi-retired, or mostly retired, so I'm not going anyplace soon. I can devote the time that's necessary to do the job of the PUD. Um, 
I don't have any, I do take a job once in a while, um, if I feel like doing it, just to keep my mind in things. And uh, a couple of brief examples I'd give you about that. Uh, in this past April, I was uh, in Turkey doing a job uh, for the Turkish government in a, in a big private utility, or private uh, company there that was looking at buying, uh, taking over this power plant. They asked me to go over and tell me what I thought about it. It was a $960 million job, and they basically went and kicked the tires. So somebody must think I know a little bit about the electric business, electric utility business. Uh, in um, June then, I, another friend of mine called, and he said, run some power plants in Montana, and his maintenance manager was going to quit. And he said, can you come help me? Uh, because I think my maintenance manager is going to leave, uh, and I need somebody to run the overhaul. I don't have, I got a young crew, and they don't have any experience. So I went over for five weeks, and did the job, uh, and it was kind of, really kind of fun getting my hands, I mean, I wasn't working, I was supervising the job, but uh, it was really, really fun getting back into the nuts and bolts of what I did for most of my career. And my career basically started uh, as a union journeyman millwright uh, back in Michigan. I worked in Michigan, Wisconsin, Illinois, and, and Minnesota, and uh, then I, uh, I was on a job on a turbine overhaul. And I came home and my youngest daughter started crying because she was afraid of me. I was gone too long. I said, it's time to do something different. Life on the road is, as you guys maybe know, is not the best thing that can happen to a family. Mm -hmm. So I had a chance to go to work for Pacific Power and Light in Wyoming and uh, I did that and I was a journeyman uh, power plant mechanic certified welder belonging to the Utility Workers Union of America. And we had a, a, a power plant there, it was a Dave Johnson plant. and. Uh, from the Dave Johnson plant, I was promoted to the WIDAC plant as a preventive maintenance engineer. And from there, I was promoted to the uh, security director at Jim Bridger Power Plant, which is a 500, it was 2200 megawatts, so just about 500 employees. Uh, that was a big job, big job. Uh, and being the safety director there was, you know, it was, uh, I had my hands full keeping, keeping that many people safe. Uh, the plant manager wanted somebody that understood how to do the job, what the people were doing to be a safety man, so that's how I got there. And from there, I got transferred uh, out here to Lewis River in 1994, where uh, I was the maintenance manager for Pacific Power and Light up on the Lewis River. And as such, I had responsibility for Pacific Corps Hydro in all of uh, Washington, Northern Oregon, and one plant in Montana. And during that period of time, uh, as, as some people know, most people know, the Swift II power plant is owned by the PUD, but they don't operate and maintain it. So Part of my job then was to operate and maintain the power plant for the PUD. So I've known a lot of the people at the PUD for a long time, uh, a lot of good folks over there. Uh, it's the, the present commission, the way they've been getting along uh, is, is really what the problem is. And as everybody knows by now, the incumbent has dropped out. So either myself or my opponent will be the next commissioner. It's, it's not exactly running as smooth as a top, is it? No, it's not. It's not. And it's a shame because, like I said, the people are, there's really good people there. You know, I've actually, I, had, I actually did one contract job for the PUD because I have a, a one-man consulting firm now. I, I, was out, um, I was out doing a line survey on, on the line from uh, the Castle Rock sub out to the Green Mountain Mill. So I've actually worked hand-in-hand -hand with the lineman. I was doing a, I have my own infrared camera, so I was doing an infrared check of the line and then the ultrasound is listening for problems. Um, so I've, I've worked with, with people in the field and um, I've worked with management there. Uh, as uh, you know, the old manager when I was there was Denny Robinson, um, and uh, so anyway, it's, it's uh, I've had a lot of experience with the PUD. Rick, okay, I have a couple of questions. Uh, one isn't on this list here, but it has come out to the community, and there's been some concern of some of the actions taken by the current uh, PUD commissioners. And one of the big things that's uh, come up lately is the decision. At least it appears through the newspaper. And we never know how accurate that is, but how the Commission is looking at relinquishing some of their responsibility to the manager and to the attorney of the PUD. What would be your position on that? Well, I, I already stated my position on that, uh, Rick, because I was actually at the meeting when that came up, and it, I've been attending meetings quite regularly since January of 2013. I haven't made every one, but I'm going to say probably 80 percent. I was at that meeting when they did that, and I got up on the floor and I asked the question, "What does that mean? What are you doing? Are you are you ceding your responsibility?" to the general manager, or does he have a veto vote, or what is it? I said, I think it's just wrong. That's, you shouldn't be doing that. And I would not do, support that, and, and I would try to roll that back as soon as I get on the commission. Okay, thank you on that one. And then another question. Uh, there's been a lot of things come up lately 
in the last couple of years concerning uh, large capital improvement projects, such as the LNG uh, biofuel facilities and, and code gens. Uh, what is your position on those type of improvements or inciting them within our uh, county? Well, I think it's obvious that this county needs jobs. Um, and the LNG, I don't really know enough about it. Some of the, the only negative thing I heard about that is it might interrupt some of the shipping, but I don't know that for a fact. But as far as uh, any other uh, power generation facilities, uh, combined cycle like you mentioned, or the methanol plant, it looks like the methanol plant is going to go in, in, in Kalama, and um, I think those things need to be done. Uh, you know, there's uh, the, the coal load out thing, and, and I, you know, some people might not like when I say this, but the fact of the matter is that coal is going to get to China somehow or other. And, you know, and that coal, and I don't have a dog in that fight. I don't own any stock in, in, uh, in, in Millennium or, or any of the coal mines or anything like that. So, but I'm just saying that somehow or other they're going to get that coal out of Wyoming and Montana out there. And the coal that they burn now is, is really inferior to what the Wyoming coal would be. So the, the Chinese, I think, are trying to do a better job of cleaning. We might be better off instead of fighting everything here, trying to help uh, improve their technology over there with, with the way they burn the coal. Because um, you just can't stop coal-fired power plants. Forty percent of our power now, you know, comes from coal in the, in the U.S. Uh, pe people are pretty unhappy with the current state of affairs at the PUD. Uh, mainly the commissioners. Uh, they're dysfunctional. Um, also, rates are going up. And how do you feel about the rates going up, and what would you try to do with the rates uh, between businesses and homes? You know, there's a difference. But there, there's a difference. Uh, the businesses, act, or commercial pays a little bit less per kilowatt hour. The, 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 we're, we're <clears throat> excuse me, a little over six cents a kilowatt hour for residential. The national average is about 12 cents. Um, and I don't know, we're not national here, but I'm just trying to put, frame it in, in something where people can get an understanding of it. Uh, 12 cents is, 12 and a half cents is the national average. Um, our rates are, are, are not bad here. They're less than, or than, than Clark County, but that doesn't mean we should keep going up. I think the last rate increase was not necessary. Uh, you know, it, it's gone up, the basic charge has gone up $10 in the last year, and that hurts a lot of people. People who are really having, you know, struggling to um, pay their bills, and you know maybe that sixty dollars a year that they added on this year might be taking drug, you know, some generic pills away from somebody that's on fixed, you know, older person on fixed income. Um, I think there could have been a different way to do that. Uh, the um, the rates that we have between business and residential, they were the, the residential rates were low, uh, kept artificially low over a period of time because that kept the voters happy. And that's the reality of it. I'm not saying we should keep raising uh, residential rates anymore. I'm not saying that at all. But there was an effort, and, and it was a good faith effort, I believe, to get rates equal, you know, more equalized. And without commercial or industrial, there's no job, so where are we? You know, we have to keep the rates fair for everybody, and that's what I would, would try to do. Okay, I think another question, you know, because it affects rates too, is the indebtedness that the PUD has. Well over 200 million, is that correct? 236, I okay. think, last count. So, uh, 236 million. Uh, how would you try to resolve some of that going into the future? Because this is certainly a, a huge amount of debt for the PUD. Uh, yes, it is. Uh, I think that what we need to do. And that's what I can bring to the table. You still need to make improvements in the system to keep, keep the service what it needs to be. You know, we're, people expect me to turn the light switch on, the lights come on. We, we need to make sure that happens. So we need to be ju judicious in, in the capital projects that we do. We should not be building another wind farm. Uh, we shouldn't have built a second one. But you can't unring the bell. We have to reduce the debt whatever way we can. So we have to keep a sharp pencil. We have to look at things like an example I like to use is, is the parking lot that the at the PUD Ops Center. That, that was a little bit overkill on that. They spent a little more money on that than I thought they should have. Uh, uh, quite a bit more. Um, because as I, I believe they used the state highway standard for concrete for that parking lot. And that's a little bit much for cars that are just sitting there. 
Uh, that's what they presented at the meeting anyway that I was at, that they were going to use a state highway standard. That would probably add 20, 30% to the cost, maybe more, I don't know. But um, anyway, I, getting back to the capital projects, I think that's what I can bring to the table because I had to prepare capital budget items for a private investor-owned utility, and they're a little bit harder to get things passed than public, you know. Uh, we, uh, if, if we needed a new governor or we needed a new transformer or we needed to upgrade a, a line or something, I had to justify that. So I, be, I can ask the right questions when, when the staff brings, brings that to the board. Is this, is, 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 you know, is this really the best way to do it or did you consider this or did you consider that? Not to micromanage, but they, they'll know that they have to have their T's crossed and their I's dotted. Et cetera, yeah. <laughs> to, to uh, you know, when they, when they bring something for approval. Okay, I, I got one final question, at least from my end of it here. I enjoy going to meetings that affects me, PUD meetings. And I find the PUD meetings sometimes to be a little overboard. A normal meeting will go to maybe an hour, an hour and a half. Sometimes they just go into everything that I'm not really into. Do they have a way somehow of summarizing things without keeping you there for two to three hours? Well, I, I think, I, I, I hear what you're saying, Rick, and I think that would be a wise thing to do because I'm sure you're not the only one. People are busy, you know. They have, you know, and they have the meetings in the afternoon uh, when a lot of people are working so they can't attend, and the people that do attend, you, know, you don't want to hear all the minutia that, that goes on, but you want to hear the bottom line. Uh, I hear what you're saying. I, I think that's a good suggestion. I don't know how it could be done, but I, I'm sure it could be. Okay, thank you. Maybe executive sessions like the port does instead of having the whole thing out in the open? Yeah, but the, I think, the, uh, on the other hand, uh, Kyle, I think they, they maybe have a little too many executive sessions, and that's where some of the yeah, worry about secrecy not. comes from, yeah. and, and so it's a sure. balancing act. Yeah. So, Lauren, we, we chose to endorse you over your uh, opponent because of your experience, vast experience, and knowledge of uh, labor relations and such. Um, do you have anything you want to say about uh, labor relations? If you're elected, you know, how you would go about um, improving relations at the PUD overall, I guess? Well, I, I, I don't really know how the relations between, you know, management and labor are there now. I, I honestly don't know. But to the effect that I could improve them, if there was a problem, I certainly would. I, I would not, I would not. Uh, and we can't manage, I can't fire anybody except if I'm on the commission. We, commissioners cannot fire anybody but the general manager. That's true. Um, mm -hmm. And by statute, I guess. But, you know, if the general manager has somebody underneath him that is not, is, you know, is getting, you know, 10 grievances a week, well, I'd, I'd take an issue with that. There's mm -hmm. something wrong. We need to look at what's causing that, you know. Very good. Because I understand that, mm -hmm. that, that, you know, and I've been on, side giving, presenting grievances as a steward, and I've been on the management side receiving grievances, and to be able to, to solve those, uh, you know, you just need to compromise, be reasonable, and, you know, put your big boy pants on and get it done. There you go. Do you have a closing statement? Um, no, I think I've probably said enough. I just really want to thank, thank uh, you all for your support and this opportunity to uh, get out in front of the people, and uh, I hope I didn't put my foot in my mouth too bad. <laughs> Did good. Well, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. Good Thank luck. for your support. I appreciate it. You're right. And I guess we are going to go ahead and wrap things up. As usual, everybody, all union members and retirees are welcome to come to our meetings. There's a second Monday of the month at 5.30 p.m. at 5.36 Oregon Way. Um, oh, I did want to mention that uh, Dean Tackle and Brian Blake, who have been longtime friends of labor, are all, again running for the 19th District House, State House, Washington. And they couldn't make it today, but uh, as always, they have our support and they have been very labor friendly throughout their careers. Um, of course, we want everybody to get out there and vote. If you're not registered to vote, please do so by October 28th. Correct. And the ballots should be out on the 17th. Um, we're probably going to be holding a couple rallies, uh, maybe some sign wavings and such uh, at the end of the month. Um, so thank you for joining us and watching another show.